For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. This is Start News Global. I'm Amit Abravi. Today we're looking at the German Chancellor's visit to India. Our expert analyst is Dr. Garima Mohan. Dr. Mohan, you just flown in from Berlin, so welcome to Delhi again. Though it's your home, of course. Good to be doing something in person. Up yeah, there. it's it's great to be here and and uh, do this in person and uh, nice time to be back in uh, Delhi with the weather being so nice. Yeah, it's getting a bit hot for us. <laughs> Just talking about the, the Chancellor's visit, there have been a lot of in the run-up uh, visits from the German side, from uh, the Indian side as well. Do you see any uh, difference in the outcomes or at least in the, in the uh, roadmap? Yeah, for me, overall, the tone and the tenor of this visit was very different from the visits we've seen by previous chancellors, particularly Chancellor Merkel. So India and Germany have a pretty good rhythm of high-level, leader-level exchanges. We have an intergovernmental consultation, IGC mechanism, whereby the two heads of state go see each other pretty regularly. This is a different visit, not just because Chancellor Scholz, it's his first visit in his position, uh, as chancellor, but also because that uh, this is the first time a chancellor is doing a standalone visit outside of the IGCs. And he's come with a pretty substantial business delegation. Um, he's come to talk about strategic issues. He's come to talk about um, sort of newer topics, which are different from the usual Germany-India partnership. So I definitely saw more sharp, a more strategic tone, um, a desire from Berlin to engage New Delhi on some of the newer issues, more strategic issues, Ukraine, China, technology, innovation, defense, uh, we usually don't see these issues covered in these meetings. So I can pick them up one by one. When you're talking about uh, Ukraine, or just a year back, we've I mean, mm -hmm. been doing a lot of programming on the year since the Russian reinvasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But three days after that, February 27th, is when the, the Chancellor again indicated or the roadmap that Germany would take, just call a, a turning point. Yeah. A year later, do you see that fructifying in the different dimensions or is that mm. moving a bit slowly? Yeah, it's Seitelwende, as they call it in, in German, has been, um, in terms of rhetoric at least, it was a remarkable shift where Germany said, finally we're ready to, you know, we've woken up to the reality of a world where geopolitics is back, borders are being contested, there's conventional warfare happening for a long time. Europe, particularly Germany, was living in this post-modern uh, post utopia of, you know, living in a post-conflict zone. Um, so in that sense, they have woken up. Change has been slow to come. Uh, they've talked about increasing defense spending. The money is there. Uh, how it is being spent, it's quite slow. There's a question mark. There was a lot of debate. The Chancellor Scholz was criticized for his uh, reluctance to provide tanks to Ukraine. Uh, whereas everybody else in Europe is more or less on the same page. Germany's uh, dragging its feet a little bit. Uh, so yeah, I think we do see a little bit of reluctance in Germany. But overall, staying in Berlin, I can tell you that the tone of the debate has shifted a lot, remarkably. People now talk about Russia and the lessons taken from Russia, which should be applied to China much more openly. This is not just a let's do more trade with China. It's a great relationship. It's very much... A question now of this is happening in Europe, there are parallels in the Indo-Pacific, how do we prevent them? And that to me is the real turning point. I have never seen Germans talk so openly about uh, these challenges, particularly challenges beyond the borders of Europe. Unpack that a little bit, but since you're talking about Ukraine, weaning off from Russian energy, security, like you're talking about the Leopard tanks, hey, that's the stage we're at now in terms of Germany and Ukraine security dimension. Is there more of an understanding? Because there have been words from both the family, the foreign minister and um, chancellor, mm. understanding India's position mm. in Russia and Ukraine. I would say there are two different aspects to that. So the political side in Europe has understood very well India's position, India's constraints, what India can and cannot say publicly. So when these leaders are now coming to India, they're not coming to pressure for public statements. They're coming to talk about behind the scenes what can we do. On the 
outside of government, I have to say, among members of parliament, among general publics, the understanding is not there. There are still a lot of questions on where India stands, why is India not taking a more public position, etc., etc. And it's sort of become caught in this cycle of point, counterpoint from our side, from their side. I do think there is some work to be done to explain our position and basically underline that our position is not the same as China's position on Ukraine. Uh, we don't want to fall into that trap. But on the government to government level, yeah, it's pretty clear our foreign minister has conveyed it very well um, in these discussions with the prime minister also it comes out. You said the real turning point to you was Germany and, and China. Mm. There has been even criticism of the Chancellor being his, his first visit uh, to China and mm. first visit after COVID from uh, the EU, etc. Mm. And Germany's historic economic business ties yeah. to China. Considering where we are with China, mm. how do you see that conversation mm. working between India and China? So I, I should um, uh, note that before Chancellor Scholz went to China, he undertook his first visit in Asia to Japan. And he made a point to do so. Japan then met India, uh, our Prime Minister in other formats, Bali, then uh, decided to go to China. And there too, it is interesting to note how much criticism there was, even in his government, of this visit and whether he should be going alone, whether he should be taking a business delegation. We never saw this. It should have been Macau either. Yes, no, not so. exactly. No, but, you know, we never saw this under Chancellor Merkel. There was an all-of-government approach. Everybody was behind the China wagon. And now the foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, who is from the Green Party, she is the most vocal critic of China, and she occupies a significant position in, in government. She was in India already in December last year. She met with uh, Minister Jay Shankar, and from what I believe, they talked about China a lot. And particularly, she was interested in understanding China in our neighborhood and, and our position and uh, drawing parallels with what is happening in Europe. Uh, so I do think in that sense, Ukraine has been an awakening and a turning point for a lot of Germans, um, even for businesses. Uh, we heard recently Siemens announcing that they are not uh, as keen on China as they were before, and they're looking at other markets. Um, of course, Volkswagen and other German companies do have vested interests, and there are some factors dragging decision-making behind. Uh, but the political resolve uh, on China, that has shifted, certainly. Okay, when you talk about bilateral relations in India and Germany, this particular visit had the mention or had the mention of defense and security, mm -hmm. and especially in India's new movement towards uh, Atman Nirbhar or mm -hmm. making India got some resonance in mm -hmm. the, the framing of the language. Yeah. And some reporting suggesting that uh, German conventional submarines could be back on the table again. I'm not sure. I don't have any further information on that. Or on the defense uh, relationship, if you'd like to elaborate. Yeah. I think one thing that I would like to stress for your audience also is the fact that India has started engaging Europe much more in the last 10 years is predicated on three things. Um, technology, innovation, and defense. And defense comes up in our partnership with Italy. It comes up with Sweden. It's not just France anymore, although France is the most important partner. So I was uh, happy to see that this was on the table with Germany as well. And the conversation was about um, what can India do together in defense, co-manufacturing, co-design. Uh, that conversation has started. Um, and of course, there will be some need for um, export control regulation on the German side that will need to be relaxed um, and India will need to be considered there. But in terms of other sort of bigger uh, platforms and, and equipment, uh, that conversation has started with Germany and this was very uh, prominent in this in this visit. When you mentioned China and the, the, the change in at least the political view in mm -hmm. Berlin and uh, business, you mentioned Siemens work, the German, uh, I think the national strategy is still to come out. Right? Yeah. The security strategy. Yeah. We're still waiting on that. Mm -hmm. Five the chancellery and yeah. founders. We are having yes. a bit of it. But the Indo-Pacific, uh, which came up 2020, was it? Uh, 2019, yeah. Hmm. Oh. Because for a lay person, when you say Germany and the Indo-Pacific, hmm. I've seen a big disconnect. Yeah. But if you could explain that to us, hmm. is that... Uh, diversification that Germany is looking at away yeah. from China. 
Exactly. I would say that the German-China strategy and the Indo-Pacific strategy go hand in hand. Um, the timing has been different. We are still waiting on the China strategy. So after the national security one, they will release the China strategy. Again, some domestic sort of push and pull between the foreign ministry and the chancellery. But the Indo-Pacific is and China are two sides of the same coin. Uh, when they talk about China's strategy, they talk about reducing dependence on autocracies, authoritarian governments, non-friendly governments. The flip side of that is where do you take your business? Where do you take your political uh, partnerships? Then to diversify in the region and they need to understand dynamics have shifted in Asia and therein comes in the Indo-Pacific strategy. So it's not so much about Germany being more present in the Indo-Pacific, sending frigates, you know, being engaged. It's more about how will Germany deal with the changing dynamics in the Indo-Pacific, which have an impact on European security as well. Uh, so it has is all encompassing its business, its political partnerships. And of course, India is very prominent in that, as is Japan, as is Australia, Singapore, South Korea and also working more with the United States as it does power projection in the Indo-Pacific. We're talking about the large business uh, delegation that the mm -hmm. Chancellor brought here and he traveled to Bengaluru as well. Uh, he has mentioned that he will personally be looking at uh, pushing or advancing right. the FTA with the European Union as yet. Mm -hmm. uh, well, economics, business ties, not only Germany, but with the European Union, mm -hmm. if you want to uh, bring us up to speed yeah. on how they are. I think one thing to note is that German foreign policy is driven a lot by its business, uh, by the companies and the businesses. So I'm glad that we in India are engaging more on that front. Um, and I, it was interesting to see they keep calling it a high powered business delegation from both sides. If you look at the list, it's on the MEA website of the companies that participated in these roundtables are, you know, German national champions, I mean, are also small and me medium-sized companies. Uh, they are very much looking for investing in India. It's a lot of companies that are either moving away from China or are looking for a China plus one more. Uh, so ease of business is very important for them. So that is one aspect. The FTA is a bigger, more complex animal, whether it is negotiated or not. And frankly, I I'm not sure how much confidence I have in the FTA because it is done by bureau technocrats in the EU Commission in Brussels. Um, but even beyond the FTA, we, there are so many smaller steps that can be taken about um, helping ease of business, uh, giving access to you know the state governments, having online portals, having information readily available. Um, and I think there are some some steps being taken by the Ministry of Commerce on this. Uh, more coordination between MEA and Ministry of Commerce and these third countries would help already. Uh, so there's a lot to do even before we reach the FDA. Sure. Yeah. Renewable, sustainable development, green technology, hydrogen, mm -hmm. ammonia, there's a lot of talk around yeah. that, some numbers which also came out of the yeah. consultation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, German government, of course, is a coalition government that has the Green Party in it. Uh, they have very high climate ambitions. Um, overall, German foreign policy has a strong focus on climate and they see that the issue of climate cannot be resolved without India's help. India has very ambitious targets on climate, renewable energy, clean technology, green technology, um, and their Europeans are the perfect partners, right? There's all the innovation that's happening there, businesses, companies that do that um, and can partner with India. So that, I think, is a leg of the partnership that is very well developed. And finally, we here understand how strategic these investments can be for building our national capacities and resilience. This talk of, uh, in terms of mobility, there has mm. been some movement, uh, the Canadian model being looked at uh, for Indians who want to study and work in Germany. Yeah, the mobility partnership was signed last year already, and it is now in the process of being ratified by the German government. Uh, once it is done, then it will come into effect. But overall, many countries in Western Europe have declining or sort of aging populations and are looking for young service professionals, attracting them from other countries. Um, I, I live in Germany, so I know that for, you know, so Indians who are studying IT and in this sector, 
it's even easier to get an EU blue card, which is a new form of a visa that um, allows you to work in different countries. It gives you more mobility. You know, there's a differentiation now between highly skilled, highly educated, young uh, professional force um, coming from India. Indian students are also interested if you study there, you want to stay a bit longer and, and work before you come back. Um, so I think now that the UK has left the union, uh, a lot of the issues that came around mobility have been managed. So we'll see much more partnerships in their signing individually, but also perhaps when the FTA comes, then with the EU at large. Quite a wide, comprehensive discussion with you, Dr. Mohan. Thank you so much. Of course, Germany has been in news in India for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Sports. <laughs> for hockey, <laughs> the wake up and yeah. golf also, uh, I believe they've been winning. So yeah. that, and that's a good news in a sense of, uh, Good news for the Germany in India. Thank you so much for sharing your analysis. And we'd like to do this more often in person. So fly down more. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And to our viewers, if you like this video, do give it a thumbs up on uh, YouTube and share this link as widely as possible. You can follow our social media handles to get the latest uh, Telegram channel. There's a scroll at the bottom of your screen. If you join that, you'll get the latest that we put up our website or interviews like this with Dr. Mona on our YouTube channel. This is Stack News Global. I'm on with our break.